Hey guys, it's Intricate from Amigalove.com. Today I've got a really strange, nerdy, uh, niche topic I wanted to bring to your attention. Amiga 2000 keyboards. Come to find out from 1987 to 1991, the time frame when they were making the Amiga 2000, the Commodore philosophy in manufacturing was evolving, and as a result, the keyboard design changed multiple times. I happen to have several of these in my possession, with each of the differences, I'd like to walk you through those differences and show you how the evolution of the keyboard maps pretty directly to the evolution of their manufacturing philosophy across their other computers. Let's go check it out inside the Amiga Studio. Back in the day, Commodore was legendary for constantly changing their hardware on the fly in order to cut costs as products matured in the marketplace. But in the early days, they often went all out. A perfect example of this evolution is the Amiga 2000 keyboard. There were at least three different keyboard designs for the Amiga 2000 during its production run from 1987 through 1991. The most obvious differences mostly involve the keycaps and the switches below. Keyboard switches are the mechanical components that provide key responsiveness, travel times, noise, and the overall tactile feel. There are two main categories of keyboard design we're going to focus on here. The first are called mechanical keyboards. These have individual key switches and metal springs. The second type I'm calling rubber cups, which are first cousins to the far more common rubber domes in today's modern keyboards and cost far less to produce. They use a rubber cup to provide resistance and act as a spring Mechanical keyboards are often the first choice of many gamers because their tactile experience can be more precise. Swinging back to the Amiga 2000 keyboards, let's take a look at some of the variations Commodore produced and dig a little deeper. One of the original Amiga 2000 keyboards Commodore created. This keyboard is pretty easy to spot. It has several design differences we can all see without even removing a single keycap. I will refer to this keyboard as the Cherry Keyboard. The first obvious difference is that, like the glorious Amiga 1000, this keyboard has bright red Amiga A keys. It also has a very small and simple badge in the upper right hand corner compared to future revisions. Removing the keycaps, we see that this fantastic keyboard has Cherry MX Black switches. These happen to be switches similar to those found in Amiga 1000s. These switches are rated to a lifespan of 50 million keystrokes per key. The sound level is rated as quiet, with a travel distance of only 4 millimeters. The keystrokes are often fluid and linear, and the feel is nice and heavy. This is a primo Commodore keyboard, and is one of the finest they ever produced. If you flip the keyboard over, you can see it actually has six plastic clips around its perimeter. You'll also discover there is no serial number or manufacturing country of origin on the bottom. The cord's plug is also uniquely shaped as it is more ergonomic and has a somewhat hourglass shape. The caps lock LED light is a vertical bar of clear plastic at the bottom of the key, not a red dot in one of the top upper corners. And the main glyphs and letter forms, also known as the legend, are closer to the Amiga 1000 in style than later revisions. Speaking of keycaps, most of these appear to be double shot. Like the early Commodore 64 bread bin keycaps, these caps are actually made with two different colors of plastic. That means the glyphs aren't printed on the keycaps, they are the keycaps. No printing is necessary. The end result is a set of letter forms and glyphs that should never fade from use or chip off. At worst, they might yellow a little bit. One final difference worth mentioning is the keyboard case's subtle yet unique color. It's more of an almond color than the typical beige. It's not known how many of these keyboards were ever made, but the number is believed to be quite low. At some point in the early days, the keyboard got a total revamp, and to the untrained eye, it might appear that little had changed, but in fact, quite a lot changed. So let's take a closer look. This next keyboard I'm calling the High Tech. 
The high-tech keyboard has more visual cues in common with its younger siblings, which we'll look at soon, so you have to look a bit more closely in order to identify it. You can see right off the bat that the red Amiga keys are now black like most Amigas. This was probably a cost-saving exercise, but also allowed the 2000 keycaps to perfectly match its sister, the more popular Amiga 500. The caps lock key displays its LED light now in the much more common circular dot in the upper right corner. Flipping the case over, we still have no serial number stickers, but we do have a large circular imprint from the injection molds and a couple of tiny little quality assurance stickers. It's kind of amazing those didn't fall off after all these years. The case is now the more typical beige most of us come to expect with our Amiga 2000 keyboards, and the case badge has gotten bigger, with a more prominent 2000 in the corner. Note the addition of Commodore in the badge now too. The keycaps do not appear to be double shot anymore. A far cheaper process of pad printing the legend on the keys is the way going forward now for all of Commodore's future keyboards. But now, let's talk about the good stuff. If you remove one of these keycaps, we see we have NMB High Tech Series 725 switches, also known as Space Invaders, or Angry Bear. Designed in the early 1980s, these highly coveted switches can reduce the height of keyboards significantly while retaining full travel, also known as having a low profile. There are several variations of switches, but the ones in the Amiga 2000 keyboards are known as white linear. This same switch can be found in some very early and quite rare Amiga 500, Commodore PC5, and PC10 keyboards. The Space Invaders feel a bit stiff while typing, which is actually kind of nice, and they're extremely stable. Unlike many Commodore keyboards, there's virtually zero wiggle in these keys. Compared to the Cherry MX switches, the Cherries are practically breakdancing, and I don't consider them wiggly at all. If there's anything I might criticize the switches for, it would be their fragility. If you take the keycaps off, there's a really good chance the spring will go flying. With so many keys to remove, the idea of cleaning this keyboard is a bit nerve-wracking for me to ponder. Also, the little metal contact hands are very fragile. In other words, these keyboards were not made to be maintained or cleaned except by keyboard experts, and I'll be leaving mine the hell alone for the most part. They look great, and they feel great, but if you dare take off their clothes, be prepared for some shock and some pain. On to the final Amiga 2000 keyboard, the Mitsumi. The Mitsumi KKQ E94C model keyboards were the final A2000 model made, and the most common. This keyboard uses Mitsumi hybrid switches with tactile buckling rubber sleeves, with a slider and a membrane. Technically, these keyboards are not considered to be mechanical. Mitsumi happens to be the same company that built the keyboards for the popular Commodore 64 C, where the C stands for cost reduced, or cheap ass bitches. They appear to have made most, if not all, of the non-mechanical Amiga keyboards and switches, which includes every single model except the original Amiga 1000. As such, these Mitsumi keyboards are a bit quieter, with the exception of the space bars which can be sometimes a bit jangly. They lean more towards the stiff yet mushy and wobbly variants. It's not gonna win any awards, but it's also a very functional device and is very easy to type on without any issues, as well as take apart and clean. It's far better than the Mitsumi switches found on the 64C. That comparison is not even close or really even fair. These keyboards feel real, if not as high quality as their mechanical siblings. Regardless, the legend on this keyboard matches that of the high-tech keyboard. And the keycaps are also pad printed, which is one of the cheapest options out there, and least durable for heavy use. We also get yet another badge in the upper right-hand corner, and we finally get a serial number on the bottom. These Mitsumi keyboards became the standard for all Amiga computers going forward, with only very subtle minor differences. The main one being that the rubber cups were swapped out for less expensive metal springs.
So guys, that's the Amiga 2000 keyboard evolution as I understand it. If you think I might have left a couple key elements out or maybe misstated a few things, feel free to go down to the comment section and in a kind and friendly tone. This is YouTube after all. Let me know. I would like to fill those gaps. And until next time, guys, keep that Amiga love flowing. Bye-bye.